I was having a conversation with my mom on the phone a couple of nights ago. She called, it was about 8.30 or so, um, and she has about a 45-minute commute from work, so she oftentimes will call and we'll talk just to kind of pass the time and catch up. And uh, so we were chatting. I noticed it was a little later than normal, so I said, you know, what's going on? What, what's the deal? She said, oh, you know, I just left. I've got this big thing at work, this project I've been doing. She works at a hospital, and her job, well, she has a lot of jobs, but her primary job is to oversee this, I don't know if it's annual or this once-in-a-while survey that takes place across the whole hospital. It's like an assessment. And, you know, if the hospital doesn't score well enough, it shuts down and everybody loses their job. So, you know, it's kind of an important thing. Uh, so this has been coming up. So she's been coming in to work. She leaves the house about 4.45 in the morning. Uh, and she'll go to work. And then she says she usually leaves about 8. And I'm not going to do the math, but that is a really long day. Uh, and so, you know, being concerned, she has pushed herself to the point where she's collapsed before. Um, so I said, hey, don't do that again. Um, take some breaks. Take care of yourself. Get some rest when you can. Get away and everything. And she said, I know, I know. And then I gave her some advice. I said, you know, if it were me, I'd just tell him, I'm leaving at 6, and i just walk out. And she said, well, haha, it's not that simple. I said, yes, it is. Clock hits 6, you get up, you go. They're not going to fire you. They can't pass this survey without you. And I said, that's what I would do. That's not what I would do at all, just between you and me. I mean, it's really easy for somebody who's not in a circumstance or somebody who's not in that situation to say, oh, yeah, this is what I'd totally do. In reality, I probably wouldn't. I would probably keep my head down and do my job just like she is. And I think a lot of us can kind of resonate with that mentality. Maybe you've had something at work that happened, and it was frustrating, and it miffed you, and you grumbled about it, and you said, I ought to go in there and give them a piece of my mind, rah, rah, rah. But when push came to shove, we probably kept our head down and did our job. Because we don't want to suffer the consequences. There's a certain stability that we have in our lives. And we like to maintain that stability. It's not that we're necessarily shying away from confrontation. I mean, it's just part of life. But given the choice, most people will try to take the path of least resistance. It's just sort of baked into us. We've seen this in other contexts. Over the last several years, let's say three, four years, our culture has had a lot of really um, impassioned uh, conversations that we've been going through. Everything from politics to healthcare and personal autonomy to race to sexuality to gender and like every other touchy subject under the sun, we've had this conversation. And everybody has an opinion on these things and everybody has a viewpoint. But maybe you kind of shied away from sharing your opinion or your viewpoint. And even though you thought somebody was wrong or something wasn't right or just didn't check out, we, we didn't really bring it up. We didn't say our piece just because we wanted to keep our heads down and maintain stability, right? There's consequences when we stick our neck out. There's an ancient proverb, the nail that sticks out gets hammered, right? There's a, a tendency within people to try to maintain this sustainability, to avoid conflict. But here's the truth. Sometimes conflict is genuinely unavoidable. There are times where it just, we can't outrun it, we can't get away from it, and in fact, sometimes conflict even comes looking for us. That's what Jesus talks about in our passage this morning. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 10. If you've got your Bibles, I want to invite you to open those at Matthew chapter 10. If you don't have your Bible, you can follow along on the screen behind, or you can download the FCC Mammoth app to your mobile device, tap the Sunday button in the bottom right-hand corner, and you'll find our sermon notes along with our passage broken down, ready for you to engage with get the most out of our time together today. This message is, is part of a, a long series called A Year-ish with Jesus. We've been in it for several months. We're almost halfway through. I know we're only in chapter 10 and Matthew has 28 chapters, but we're going to start moving pretty rapidly through a lot of this. So we're about at the halfway point, church, so stick with me. We did it. It's only six more months, eight, eight more months. Woo! So anyway, sometimes conflict is unavoidable. So here's the scene, here's the context of Jesus in Matthew chapter 10. So he's been traveling around Israel for several months, maybe as long as a year, and he's been preaching this message, the kingdom of God. And that's good news. It's basically this message, God is in charge now. And we'll unpack that a little bit more as we keep going. But he's been healing people, casting out demons, doing a lot of great stuff. And now it's time for his disciples, his followers, to go out. And it's their turn to do some ministry. 
And this is sort of their first foray into ministry and preaching and all that stuff. So Jesus is giving them like a pep talk, sort of. You'll see. Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. It says, These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. And as you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff for the worker is worth his keep. So here's how Jesus starts. Y'all are going to go out and preach. And you're going to go talk about the kingdom of God, this idea that God is in charge, this idea that we can be cleansed of our sin, that we can be in communion and fellowship with him. More than that, though, that he's the one moving history in a direction where injustice is met with justice, where wrongs are righted, where nations are healed, where people can actually like dwell in the presence of God. This is a good thing. God's taking charge. And while you go out and preach this message, I want you to do a bunch of really cool, great stuff for people. I want you to heal their diseases, and I want you to drive out demons, and I want you to like drive out leprosy and give them their lives back. Do this great stuff and just bless people while you give them this great message. Sounds pretty good, right? I mean, sounds like kind of an easy gig. Go out, do great stuff. Everybody's going to love it, except apparently when they don't. Verse 11, whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at the house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it's not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust from your feet. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. So while it may sound like they've got a great gig, go out, preach this great message, do this great stuff, there will be some people that for whatever reason just don't like it. Some people will be inhospitable, some people will be unfriendly, and Jesus is basically telling these guys, hey, some people are just not going to like you. Get over it, shake it off, move on. And that's so hard for some people to hear, right? Like if you're a people pleaser, that's like nails on a chalkboard. Someone won't like me? I've got to fix this. No, it's not going to happen. Sometimes people just don't like you, and that's okay. But it gets a little more intense. Keep reading. Look at verse Uh, 16. I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. Will you be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues? On my account, you'll be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. So things have kind of escalated a little bit. And it's a little more dangerous than just some people won't like you and they'll give you a mean face. It's now, you may have legal consequences for the ministry you're about to embark upon. You may have to stand before public trained prosecutors. You may even suffer physical harm because of this. Like things are getting really serious. And all of a sudden, this is quickly becoming the worst pep talk in the history of pep talks. Right? Like, Jesus, have you done this before? But we keep reading. There's more still. Verse 21. Brother will betray brother to death. And the father his child. Children will will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You'll be hated by everyone because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. So how did we get from, some people will be kind of unfriendly, to your kids will hand you over to be executed? Because that's a really broad spectrum of consequence, right? Well, it helps to understand a little bit that everything in verse 15 following is probably not Jesus speaking about this immediate situation. In other words, when the 12 disciples go out into Israel for the first time, they're probably not going to be arrested. They're probably not going to be handed over for execution, all this stuff. People will be a little unfriendly, and that's probably the extent of it. Everything from verse 15 onwards, though, Jesus is probably talking about the future ministry of the church. And we say that because all of this stuff did happen. When Jesus was crucified, buried, raised back to life, and then on the day of Pentecost, the disciples went out and began to preach, the church was born. 
And they're given the job, take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And as that gospel went, all of these things we just read started to happen. And people were arrested. And people were standing trial. And people were flogged. People were handed over by their friends and their family and their neighbors. Some of them were executed. We read about the first martyr, Stephen, in Acts chapter 7. Didn't take very long. This is kind of extreme stuff. And so Jesus is talking about this. That doesn't really answer our question of like, how did we get to this point though? Because remember, this message, this, this message of the kingdom and the salvation, this is good news. So how did we get all this bad stuff happening as a result? Here's the reality. This is a good message. It's the message that God is in charge. Here's the flip side. If God is in charge, I'm not. And that's something that some people just cannot live with. Because if God is in charge, I don't get to determine what my truth is. And I don't get to determine what my morality is. And I don't get to determine what reality is. And there is an authority that I have to submit to with every fiber of my being. I don't get to be God. And that's the first and most persistent temptation that humanity has had to deal with since the beginning. Go back to Genesis chapter 3, the very beginning, Garden of Eden. The serpent comes to Eve to tempt her. Hey, take a bite of that fruit. She says, I can't eat that fruit. God says it'll kill me. And the serpent's words, you will surely not die, or surely you will not die. For God knows that when you eat of the fruit, your eyes will be opened and you will be like him, knowing both good and evil. You can be God, Eve. You can stand in his place, you can sit on the throne, you can be autonomous, you can answer to yourself. The biggest lie we've ever been sold. But it's a lie that means so much to so many people that when it is threatened, they kind of take it out and shoot the messenger, so to speak. That's kind of, you've heard that phrase, right? Don't shoot the messenger. And we've probably been in that situation where we've got bad news to deliver and we're just like, you know, it's not my fault, I'm just passing it on. That's kind of what Jesus is saying here. This message of the kingdom is so existentially threatening that some people will shoot the messenger. Sometimes conflict, as much as we might want to avoid it, is unavoidable. Now, we might be saying to ourselves, okay, we get it. It happened in church history, but surely it doesn't happen today. And it certainly doesn't happen here in this country. You know, it's just, this is a thing that just on a mild scale, people might have to deal with sometimes in small pockets. I wish that were true but it's not. In fact, this past month in May, I get a publication in my inbox. Um, I get a lot of publications in my inbox, but don't ever give your inbox out to people or your email out to people. But anyway, so I get this publication and it's got stories in there. One story that caught my eye was the story of a, a gal named Maggie DeJong. And Maggie is a 20-something year old graduate student. Her desire is to be a therapist who uses art therapy to work with children who have social um, and just developmental challenges to help them work through that. Incredibly noble cause. You don't go into a field like that unless you're just driven by compassion. And that compassion is fueled by her belief in the gospel. And she believes that everybody is made in the image of God and everybody deserves that healing and that care because that's what she's received through Jesus. So her faith fuels her. So one of the most prestigious and elite programs for this kind of work is actually located in Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, just three hours south of here. It's a school that my family and I lived about 20, 25 minutes from for a number of years. My sister graduated from there. So this is like our backyard. And this program is so elite, about 22 students a year are permitted into it. Maggie was fortunate enough to be permitted into this very prestigious program. And she very quickly learned that the ideologies and the views driving this program were fundamentally opposed to her convictions as a preacher or as a, a Christian. And so at first she kind of just didn't say a whole lot, but soon she came to understand that, that these views actually did more harm in helping pe in, in their therapy than they did in actually healing and bringing peace to these kids. And so she started to speak up and she did so kindly and she did so respectfully, but she would push back against opinions or views or she would offer dissenting opinions or she would vocalize, you know, concerns over matters and issues. And she didn't just do this in class. She would do this with her cohorts, her cohorts, her 22 fellow students. They would have conversations on social media and in person, and she would say, well, this is my view, and this is why I hold this, because of my faith in Christ. And then she would say, I see your view lacking for this reason. And then her fellow students would respond, and they would critique her view. And that's the way that education is supposed to work. 
we get different ideas and, and perspectives and opinions and we debate and we compare and we contrast and hopefully we both emerge sharper thinkers on the other side. But that's apparently not how education works anymore, at least not at SIUE. Because Maggie received not one, not two, but three different email notifications from three different administrators, all within the 15-minute window, so they were kind of talking about it, notifying her that she was to comply with a zero-contact order regarding three of her fellow students. They felt physically unsafe because of Maggie's extreme views that men are men and women are women and that race actually doesn't hold us back in life and that it doesn't determine who we are. Extreme things, right? And so Maggie was put under this order. That impacted her a lot. She could not physically attend certain classes because these students were in them. She could attend online and listen, but even her comments were censored and she couldn't contribute in many ways. Sometimes she was physically barred from certain areas of the campus because she might come into physical contact with these students. She would nullify the order and she would be punished in some way, potentially expelled. Campus police were copied on this message so that she could be issued citations if ever she was found in violation of it. Some of her conversations were made public uh, through a student publication which accused her of being racist and homophobic and every ist and every ism that you can think of that typically applies in this situation. One of her private messages uh, to one of her classmates explaining, I have these views because of my faith in Jesus Christ, was taken and, and turned into a public student art project called The Crushing Weight of Microaggressions. She was humiliated in front of her student body. And then she came to understand that her professors, who really initiated this process, were not only responsible for overseeing the, or determining whether she would graduate, but oftentimes whether she would find employment afterwards. And all of a sudden, her job prospects seemed to look rather dim. And this began to weigh on her, and she lost sleep, and she lost weight, and she developed chest pains and shortness of breath. This is a girl in her 20s. This was the cost of speaking up of saying, here's what I believe is true, and here's what I believe is false, in a kind and respectful manner. This kind of thing happens all the time, church. I get half a dozen stories every month in my inbox about the implications and the conflicts that arise when we stand on our convictions and are faithful to the gospel. And some of us may be saying, well, why didn't she just keep her mouth shut and keep her head down and do the work? I mean, you don't have to believe the things that you're learning or writing about. Why didn't she just stay quiet? And that kind of goes back to what we talked about earlier. There is something inside of us that really wants to resist or shy away from and shrink back from the conflict. But the conflict is unavoidable because sometimes not speaking up in the face of what is wrong and what is wicked is the same as turning our back on what is true and what is right and what is holy. There's conflict either way. It's either going to be a conflict with the opinions and dissenting voices of our world or a conflict with our convictions and our faith and our conscience. It is unavoidable. We just get to pick which one we engage in. Conflict happens. But I don't want this to be a really downer sermon, and I don't think Jesus really did either. Because as he keeps talking to his disciples, he gives us some hard truths, but buried in there are some encouragements to keep in mind as we go through this life and as we inevitably enter into these conflicts and find ourselves in these situations. And the first one has to deal with Jesus' presence and remembering who stands with us in the midst of these conflicts. Let's keep reading what he has to say. Verse 24 says, The student is not above the teacher, nor a servant above his master. It's enough for a student to be like his teacher, their teachers and servants to be like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebul, how much more the members of his household? So Jesus, if I could paraphrase, he's essentially saying, hey, if they treated me this way, they're going to treat you this way too. If they treat the teacher this way, they're certainly not going to treat the students any different. Up to this point in his life, Jesus had been ridiculed and slighted by the religious leaders. He'd been accused of being demon-possessed, which is where that Beelzebul comment comes from. And if you know the gospel, you know it's not going to stop there, that Jesus' suffering would continue to the point of execution on a cross where he was wrongly and illegally convicted of dissension, or dissent, and uh, I don't remember the exact charge, but basically a coup of the government. Crazy stuff. And Jesus is telling his disciples, if I experience this, you most certainly will too. It's kind of like that game, Follow the Leader. You know, when you were a kid, if you ever played that game, the rules are super complicated. Just, you know, follow the guy in the front, follow the leader. And wherever the leader goes, 
you're supposed to go too. So if the leader goes through this big mud puddle and emerges on the other side all gucky and grimy, chances of you going through that same mud puddle, sparkling clean in fresh linens without a drop on you, is next to nil. If we follow the leader through the mud, we're probably going to emerge just as gunky and grimy as he did. And in that same way, if we're walking with Christ and we're standing on what is true and what is godly and what is holy, we're probably going to experience the same kinds of conflicts that he experienced. But maybe that's not a bad thing. There's a silver lining to that. Because it means that my life has come to look so much like Jesus that people are treating me like Jesus. And isn't that kind of the goal of our faith? To look like our Savior? To walk with Him in such tight communion that we begin to look like Him in our thoughts and in our speech and in our love and in our graciousness? Maybe this isn't a bad thing. You know, I had uh, several preaching professors in college. It's remarkable. They all had the same book of one-liners that they tried to teach us throughout the semester. But one of them that they all drilled in our heads was this. You are inevitably going to preach a sermon that upsets somebody. But don't take that to mean it was a bad sermon. Jesus was the greatest preacher that ever lived, and they crucified him. So if somebody reams you for preaching faithfully, hold your head high because you stand in good company. And that same thing applies to each and every one of us. If somebody wants to invite conflict or bring conflict into our lives because we have respectfully, and that's such a crucial word to couch all of this in, respectfully stood on the truths of the gospel. And we have kindly, it's such another important word, kindly oppose that which is contrary to the truth. If we suffer because of that, so be it. We stand in good company. Jesus stands with us amidst those conflicts. Now, if we're being big buttheads and just built bullying people with the Bible and thumping them on the head, you kind of deserve what you get, right? That's not a Christian attitude. But if kindness and graciousness and respect mark our character and we still experience conflicts, that's not the worst thing in the world. In fact, Jesus kind of tells us that's what should happen. Things are going like they should. So be encouraged. Here's another hard truth, but also it, it, it's a word of wisdom to us. Remember the difference between what is immediate and what is important. We talk about this a lot here in different contexts. So let's read what Jesus says, and then we'll put it in the context of our conversation today. Verse 26, do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed, or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Again, if I could just paraphrase Jesus a little bit. Don't concern yourself too much with the words and the conflicts of today because they don't last. They don't stretch on into eternity. They don't carry any weight beyond the few decades we may tread this earth. Somebody may malign us or slander us. There may be conflicts we are forced to deal with, but they deal with the now and nothing more. They're immediate. And sometimes we can mistakenly assume that immediate things are important because they're right here, right now. But there is a distinction. For instance, my youngest son, Ben, uh, he's a bit of a sugar fiend. He's going to be four soon. He loves sweet things. And every morning for the last two years, without exception, every morning we have this ritual we go through. We get up, we go stand in front of the pantry. I say, Ben, what do you want for breakfast today? Every morning, without fail, I want a sweet snack. And I say, no, we can't have a sweet snack. We have to eat healthy things. And then, I don't want healthy things. I want a sweet snack. Every morning, every morning for the last two years, without fail, all of this is happening immediately, loudly, on my kitchen floor before even a drop of coffee has hit my system. It would be easy to mistakenly assume this is important. This is something we need to fix and remedy. Somebody needs to get this kid some sugar stat, right? We got to stop these tears. That would be a mistake because those tears are not important. What is important is making sure my son eats a healthy, balanced diet that is going to fuel his growing body. 
What is important is teaching him and establishing dietary habits that will carry him through a lifetime in good health. That's important. But all of those things don't really have a lot of pressing need in the immediate. You get me? They all deal with things that are kind of in the future a little bit. And that's the thing. Important things oftentimes don't seem pressing because they're off in the distance, in the horizon, in the future. Immediate things, they're here, they're now, they're waving their hands in front of your face trying to get your attention, claiming that they're important. But there is a distinction. Here's what Jesus is saying. There are criticisms and conflicts that we will engage with today that are immediate, but they are not long-lasting. They are temporary. But there are words, and there is a judgment that is forever, that is eternal, that is ongoing, beyond what our tiny imaginations can even dream or imagine. Those words are important. That verdict is important. It may seem far off, but it's far more pressing that we get this right. So here's kind of the choice that we have. We can satisfy the immediate voices. We can keep our heads down, keep our mouth shut, not get into trouble or make waves, maintain that stability in the immediate But the important conclusion that we're all aiming for and yearning for in our deepest being will be in serious jeopardy. That's where the conflict lies. Or we can just accept that there's going to be conflict in the immediate, but it's temporary. And someday there is a great and glorious reward that is going forever and ever and ever, and we will enjoy eternal stability in the presence of God. That's the choice. The conflict is unavoidable. We just get to choose which one we'd rather deal with. And that kind of leads into this last bit of wisdom that Jesus reminds us of. Loyalty is rewarded. And I know even as I was writing that, I'm like, that kind of makes it sound like we're in the mob. But it's true. Loyalty is rewarded in the family of God, right? Let's hear what Jesus says. This is verse 32. Whoever acknowledges me before others... I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who loves their son or their daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Sometimes there is this misnomer that Jesus' prime directive, like his main goal, was just love and peace and everybody get along. And that's just so misguided. It's not that Jesus is opposed to any of that. But his main message, as we said earlier, was the kingdom of God is coming. God is in charge. There is a day coming when all of history will culminate in the great judgment where he brings justice to an unjust world, where he brings peace to the brokenhearted, where he sets wrongs right, where things are as they should be now and forever. That's where all this is going. And there is salvation from that judgment through the blood of Jesus. That's the message of the gospel. That's what Jesus came to preach. But as we said earlier, some people just in their deepest being do not want that. And so there inevitably is going to be division. Because these two views are fundamentally opposed in every way. And unfortunately, sometimes that dividing line takes place through some of the most significant relationships of our lives. Sometimes, parents and children. There's the dividing line because somebody wants to follow Jesus and embrace God's kingdom and somebody does not. Sometimes it is the dividing line between families. Sometimes it's the dividing line between friends. And it is so tempting because we love these people so dearly. It's tempting to just just shrink back a little bit, to not bring it up, to not say anything, to compromise a little because these relationships are so important to us to keep intact. And that, again, is the choice that Jesus presents us with. Will we compromise and cling 
to people who do not in their deepest being want to love God? Or will we stand on what is true and cling to the God who loves us so much that he sent his son to rescue us and to save us and to give us his unending gift? And that choice, by the way, doesn't mean cutting people out of our lives at all, but it does mean I will stand on what is true and there might be a cost. It is challenging. It's maybe one of the most challenging. I've spoken to many mothers before who this is their least favorite verse in the Bible because it says if you love your kids and you cling to your kids and you seek to please them above me, you're not worthy of me. There's a choice. Who are we going to honor and put on the throne? Disloyalty is not forgotten, but loyalty is rewarded. Jesus even says at the end there, if we seek to to find our lives, so to speak, to maintain the stability throughout this world, avoiding the turmoil and the consequences, we will ultimately lose the life that we're yearning for. But if we lose our lives for his sake, if we are willing to embrace the conflict, so to speak, he will recognize us before his Father. We will find life eternal with him. That's the choice. Loyalty is rewarded. I've been reading a lot about the Revolutionary War lately, and not really because I aim to. It strangely just finds its way into my Google searches a lot lately. I don't know. But anyway, so I've been reading about it. And sometimes it's, it's tempting to think that there were very clear lines cut, that like all the colonists were on one side and all of the British were over here. But the reality was the colonists among themselves, they were very divided. There were some that still wanted to remain part of the, the empire, wanted to be a colony. They wanted to be loyal to the British crown and not to the cause of the colonies. And when everything was all said and done and the war shook out and we won our independence, those people who were not loyal to the cause were actually expelled from the states. There were about 70 to 80,000 of them. And some of them took refuge in Canada. Some of them took refuge back in Britain. And eight states even went so far as to sign into law, if you come back here, we will kill you. This loyalty was not forgotten. But those colonists who embraced the conflict and said, we will stand with this cause, even if it costs us, even if it throws our lives into complete and utter turmoil, we will stand for this cause. There was reward for that loyalty. They were given this gift of a new nation that they could shape and participate in that would ultimately end up shaping the trajectory of the entire world over the next 200, 250 years. There is a blessing. There is a reward that comes with loyalty. And the same is true for us, church. Do we want to find our life today and ultimately lose what matters? Or will we be willing to embrace conflict and along with it embrace this reward that ultimately comes to those who stand on their faith and convictions? That's the choice. And it's not an easy choice, which is why Jesus preaches this message to his disciples. It has always been a challenge throughout the history of the church. And sometimes people have succeeded and sometimes people have failed. There's a long list in church history of great martyrs who've been willing to lay down their lives and a great long list of people who shrunk back. Sometimes it's a challenge. And that's why we preach messages like this today. Because maybe we don't live in a country where our lives may be thrown into the, the, the danger or maybe, you know, everything we own will be seized from us by the government. But we do live in a world where there's conflict relationally, where there's conflict socially where there is conflict and temptation to shrink back from what is true and what is right and to just keep our heads down and our voice quiet about what is evil or wicked. Do not shrink back. In all kindness and graciousness, in all charity and in all respectfulness, stand on the gospel. Stand on what is true. Speak the word of God and do not allow evil to pass for good. Don't shrink back from our faith. Be faithful, be loyal, and reap the reward that comes from following Jesus in this life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these words of encouragement because sometimes it's hard. It's just really stinking hard. And it is tempting to shrink back or to just stay quiet and not say anything. But our omission is permission, Father. And sometimes we give permission to evil, to flourish and to thrive, or we give permission for sin to take root and to germinate and grow. So in our own hearts and in our lives and in our community, Father, give us a boldness and give us compassion and graciousness. And with all kindness, help us to speak what is true and help us to stand on the convictions given to us through the gospel of Jesus that you are in charge and your word rules the day. 
ought to speak with love and compassion to those who may not understand the gospel or may not understand your goodness. Give us courage to embrace these views and these convictions even when we're tempted by uh, consequence, maybe at work, maybe in our social circles, maybe even in our families. Bless us with that faith and help us to grow and flourish in it that we might grow to look more and more like Jesus, not just in our morality, but sometimes even in our suffering. Through and through, Father, help us to honor him with our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.